Well, let's talk about how to get and set or to view the values of and or change the values of SSIS variables, user variables, what we're talking about here. Uh, so I'm, I've got my integration services package from the previous two videos that we've been working with. And I've got a variable called number of rows. It has package scope. It's int32. We'll talk about scope here uh, in the next video. And its initial value is set to a zero. Okay, so let's just kind of bring this over here. We don't need all this other here, so that way I can have a little more screen room here. So what I did in the last video was I added a script task, and the script task had popped a pop-up that showed us the value of what was in the variable. And I want to show you how to do that in this video. So let's see, um, what language do we want to start? You know that we can do this in either Visual Basic, Visual Basic, or C Sharp uh, in SQL 2008, right? We have the choice of both languages to use with the script task. So uh, which one should we start with here? I'm looking for a coin. Okay, I've got a guitar pick here. Maybe you can hear my guitar in my office right there. Uh, so I'll put heads the side with the writing and tails the side without. Let's see what we go with first. Um, oh, well, I guess I need to assign. So let's make visual basic heads and C sharp tails. Okay. And we flip and it's heads. So we're going to go with visual basic first. Sorry, C sharp. Uh, go back to my toolbox, grab a script task. We'll name this one Visual Basic. And I'm going to say after the data flow task, because the data flow task uh, is going to assign my number of rows variable, then I'm going to go into Visual Basic and notice what we have here. So, oh, well, let's stop, Scott. Go up here, change my language. So, this part really doesn't change uh, for both C Sharp and VB, uh, but you. What this is doing is it is locking values for writing so that if you pass something in here, if you say I want uh, to use the variable number of rows, you are acquiring an exclusive lock on number of rows so that no one else would be able to read number of rows until you had released it. Okay, so this is going to potentially affect your concurrency of your SSIS package, how many tasks can run at one time. Because you can get into blocking situations where one task is reading or writing a variable while another is trying to read it, and you get concurrency problems here. Okay? So don't put don't just get in the habit of putting things in read-write variables. If you only need to read it, just go up here and do the read-only variables. So you have the nice little ellipsis, which is a very welcome addition here. Uh, so click on the ellipsis here. And you have access to, and I'll go ahead and I'll expand this, you have access to all of our system variables that we saw. And then there be our user number of rows and we can see it and so I just want to check the box right there no reason to lock these variables for reading if you're not going to work with them so here's what I'm gonna do I'm going to choose the user number of rows and say OK and you can see that it has prefixed with the namespace right there in the read-only variables this is a this is one of those optional steps that it's a good practice to do this, but we don't always end up doing it. Uh, what's going to happen here is if there are no other variables with the name number of rows, it will automatically look in the collection and just kind of loop through every single one until it finds a variable named number of rows, and then it will be able to find it. So from a performance standpoint, it's going to be slightly faster to prefix the namespace because it knows exactly where to get it. But provided there are no other variables with that exact same name, it's going to work fine. Okay. Uh, oops, and I had it cancel and uh, taken it out of there. So I have now locked this for read. So now 
this is exactly what I want to do. I'm not going to be changing the value. The only time I would want to use the read write variables is when I plan on changing the value of the variable so that after leaving this script task, the value has changed. Okay, when I do that, I lock it exclusively for write. I don't need to do that here. I just need to lock it for read. Now, I can do this in code. Let me just say this. This, is, uh, this little section right here is an optional section. I can lock one for read or lock one for write, which is methods and the variables collection, the variables class. And, and there are times to do that right now at the outset of the chapter. It's not the time to discuss that. So I'm just going to say I have access in the read only to number of rows. And I click my edit script. And I'm inside my visual basic down here. And the development team does a great job of telling you how to do everything here. Um, not a whole lot here, but just do notice this. It says, hey, if you want to reference a variable, that's how you do it. And hey, remember case sensitive. So that's all I have to do right there. And the other thing that I have to know is that in the system, windows, forms, there is the message box class. And message box has a method called show, which will show a certain set of text. So I can show the, the value of the number of rows variable is, and I can say DTS. I could just really copy and paste up here and just get this right number of rows remember that it has to be case sensitive right? and I'm ready to go right so easy to do so this is the key part that you need to know you want to show a little message box this is the code those of you that know dotnet programming you know that you could use an import statement here um, I'm not gonna so I'm just pathing it directly out here. Uh, and then the dts.variables, we're using a collection. And the variable we want from the collection is number of rows. And it has a property called value. That's what we want. And I say OK. And we run this. The data flow task populates our variable. And in Visual Basic, we get an error message here. Okay, So we have to zoom through. We have to figure out where our error message is. And we take a look. And here we get an exception here. Conversion from string to type double is not valid. Oh, you know what we did, right? We need to throw a to string. Okay, so when we come back over here, remember number of rows was a numeric. We come back to our code and we need to say, oh yeah, you, you are going to be converted to a string. So we are sending back a string, therefore we have to say to string. And that's all we have to do. We simply say OK, or rather hit F5, and we get a nice little family friendly pop-up. The value of the number of rows is 13. Easy, right? Not a whole lot to it. So that's the VB way. Now, for those of you uh, that are done with VB, VB is done. You can stop. I'm not going to talk about anything more exciting in this video. Next up, C Sharp. Okay. So now, for the Sharpies out there, I will grab a script task. And I will put this in here. Let's call this one the C Sharp. You know, I don't know. Can I do that? Yeah, it accepts that. That The naming convention is kind of sticky about what characters it will accept. OK, so this time I want to choose C Sharp. And did you hear the discussion in the VB? Uh, section that I did about the read only and the read write variables. Um, if you did, you can skip over until I'm finished with this. I'm assuming that you didn't because I said earlier, hey, I'm going to uh, talk about VB and skip over to the C sharp. So I'm assuming that you didn't hear this discussion here. So I'm going to just start it over. Okay, so what we're dealing with here. If you want to access the variables easily, 
from within your C-sharp code, you will write out which variables that you want to work with here. Number of rows. And I would put number of rows in the read-only variables because I'm not going to change the value of the variable in my C-sharp. I just need a read-only copy. Now, before you get into the habit of, well, I'm just going to go ahead and lock it uh, every time, uh, I'm going to put it in read-write because I may choose later on to write to it. Right now, I don't need to, but who knows? I'm, I may want to do it. Well, let me tell you what happens. When you put this into a read-write variable, it locks it exclusively. And that means that this task can now become a blocking task if there are other tasks trying to read the value of the number of rows uh, variable, then they would have to wait for this task to complete because it would lock it exclusively. If you put it in the read-only variables, it locks it for reading, which says that there are any number of tasks that could read this concurrently, but nobody can write to it while I am reading it. So it's just like optimistic locking concurrency uh, in databases. There's really nothing different about how that actually works. Now let's talk about what goes into these values. You can type the name of your variable in. Uh, remember that it's case sensitive, right? And if you do it this way, what SSIS is going to do is it says, OK, we're dealing with a, a variable called number of rows. It will look through all of the variable names that are defined until it finds one. And if it doesn't find one, it's going to error out saying that that particular parameter or that particular variable is not found in the collection. Um, What's confusing about this, though, is what happens when you have two variables in two different namespaces that have the same name. Then SSIS bombs out. Like, uh, for example, uh, there is in the system, there is a variable called start time. What if you made a variable called start time, too? Well, you can see right here that this is in the system namespace. And if I scroll up, you can see that when we created the number of rows, it was in the user namespace, right? So if you created one called start time, I want to see if I can get one of these, both of these together. Okay. So if you created one called start time, now you'd have a system start time and a user start time. And when SSIS were to look at this, if you had just said start time and had two variables with that, you would get an error message from SSIS saying, hey, you got two variables that have the same name. What are you thinking? Which one do you want to use? Uh, it's not really going to say that, is it? No, these error messages in SSIS are generally god-awful, right? They're going to give you some cryptic message that you won't be able to figure out without going up to a search engine and spending 30 minutes trying to track them down. Uh, but in the end, that would be the actual problem. Uh, so you're better off, if you can, if you know what it is prior to executing this, you're better off just choosing it over here. And what it will do is it will go ahead and prefix that's what we call this. This is the namespace prefix. It will prefix that particular name, that particular variable. And once you come in here in the edit script, the SSIS developers did a fantastic job of giving us some great code samples. That's exactly how you use it. So the DTS class, I'm trying, I'm looking for my yellow, okay, has the variables collection. And in the variables collection, you just type in the name of your variable. And then you have the value property gets returned. And the value is of a data type uh, that the variable's data type is. So that's the first part you need to know how to actually reference this. The second thing you need to know to make a pop-up is you're going to have to access the system windows forms namespace. And then you use the message box class. Because you're going to pop up a message box, and you want to use the show method. And the text you want to use is the value of number of rows is. And then you can just copy and paste. And 
and close it off right there. Okay, and I need to put my number of rows. Go ahead and execute it. Let me disable the Visual Basic one for now. Uh, and so your data flow task runs great. You get down to C sharp. C sharp implicitly types the value of the variable because you are concatenating with a string. It says, hey, I know that you're taking numbers and strings, but I'm going to automatically make that a string. So you didn't actually have to use the to string. It implicitly did it for you. Now that may not have made any sense to you, but for those of you who watched the Visual Basic, you understand. Uh, in Visual Basic, we had to declaratively say dot to string at the end of the value. Okay, okay. well there you've got it.